Martins, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you all at this ISAP Connect. Today we have with us three distinguished, distinguished colleagues, Pedro Sanchez Miguel, Tapia Serrano, could not, could not join us, but will be in the presentation of, of Pedro. He prepared everything with Pedro. Handy Daldi Smith and uh, Ruth Santos. Our colleagues are going to share with us their experience and insights regarding the 24 hour movement guidelines paradigm and its possible pedagogical implications for physical education, school, sport, and public health sectors. Pedro, uh, Andre, and Ruth, in the name of ISEP, we thank you very much for being with us today and for sharing these 60 minutes with a, with a good coffee. Uh, before giving the floor to you, I will just make a brief introduction uh, for each of you. Pedro Sanchez Miguel is a professor at the University of Extremadura, Spain. His main research interests are related to physical education, physical activity promotion in youth and through schools teacher training, and of course, the 24-hour movement guidelines. Tapia is a brilliant PhD student uh, that is working also at the University uh, of Extremadura, Spain, and is being co-directed by Pedro. Handy Daldi Smith is a reader in uh, physical activity and healthy childhood, and he is at the Faculty of Health Studies at Bradford University. He is the Wolfson Healthy Childhood Research Team Lead and co-director of the Center for Applied of Educational Research. Some of his uh, main research interests are related to physical activity promotion in youth, active schools, and uh, physical literacy. And he is a world leader in his field and has many research projects and papers published around these themes. Ruth Santos, uh, my dear friend, is a professional, uh, professional researcher. She's at the Research Center in Physical Activity, Health and Leisure, Faculty of Sport, University of Porto, Portugal. Ruth's main research interests are related to physical activity and health promotion um, at the population level. Ruth is leading several funded projects related to the 24-hour movement guidelines and also has a lot of research in this area. So regarding our organization of this conversation, I remind all the participants that, the that during the presentations, you can pose your questions in the chat. Uh, in the last 10 minutes, I will bring some of those questions for our presence today, and we can uh, discuss, uh, go to the question and answers part. So I think we are ready to go, Pedro. The floor is yours. You can uh, share your screen, please. Uh, yes. OK. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much to the organization. Thank you very much, Joao, for inviting me. Thank you very much, Cassandra. Uh, it is a great pleasure for, for me to, to give you to speak here in, in, in this place uh, with colleagues such as Rook Santos, uh, uh, Andy Daly Smith, uh, who I'm reading them a lot of times, but it's the first time I'm seeing them face face to face. It is a great pleasure for me. I'm sorry uh, because of my English or my pronunciation, because I'm not getting used to speaking here uh, in my place. Uh, but I think I'm trying to do to do my best. Well, I'm gonna speak about uh, pedagogical proposals from the school for the treatment of the 24 hour movement behaviors. I'm gonna show you a little brief, a little background, sorry, and then some investigations we are conducting. Well, what is this uh, healthy, I change here. Uh, what is healthy lifestyle? It is well known that uh, worldwide trends in body mass index, underweight, overweight, they are increasing in all around the world. There are a lot of uh, population uh, regarding children and adolescents who are overweight or obesity in all around the world. And overall, in Spain, we have this, well, this problem, this public health problem, where uh, around one, point, uh, one out of three uh, children and adolescents, they have uh, obesity or they have overweight. Regarding uh, 
physical activity, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, try to give explanation one by one of the variables that compose later the 24-hour movement. Uh, uh, physical activity, it is well known that the benefits uh, regarding physical uh, level reduction of adiposity, improved physical conditions, psychological reduction of stress, anxiety, better discipline and quality of life, uh, overall at cognitive level, increased attention, learning, improved academic performance. Well, recently, uh, the World Health Organization recommend that from the five till uh, 17 years old, all children and adolescents must uh, perform or practice 60 minutes per day of mothers to viewers physical, sorry, activity, mainly aerobic. And well, then uh, in a recent uh, uh, researches, uh, the global trends uh, show us that there is insufficient physical activity among uh, adolescents. And these levels, they are, uh, they, this, this lack of uh, physical activity, they are higher in girls regarding the relationship between boys and girls. So uh, we can see that, not, we can see, sorry, here, why the uh, importance of uh, physical activity, uh, the importance of the consequence of physical activity, they are not uh, uh, showing in boys and girls and overall in girls which are higher the, the levels, um, the levels of uh, inactivity. Uh, regarding sedentary behavior, uh, it is well known that recreational spring time, uh, this type of behavior, uh, as you know, sedentary behavior, there are a lot of different behaviors, educational, relaxing, social, and recreational screen time, screen time and recreational. This is the uh, most negative uh, screen uh, sedentary behaviors around or among children and adolescents. Well, uh, in a, sorry, because I don't know, the slide, yeah, yeah. Uh, because it was uh, found that boys spend more time in front of screen than girls, and this exposure a conduct or lead to children and adolescents to a lot of uh, benefit or damage. Well, at the physical level, higher adiposity index, lower metabolic risk, uh, poor physical condition, reduced well being, increased anxiety and stress, uh, decreased academic performance, which is a topic we have uh, researched at, uh, in deep, and sleep and physical activity. Well, most Spanish, uh, the recommendation service uh, is uh, or are not to uh, spend more than two hours per day of seven time and screen time. We have found that uh, this uh, behavior is more negative during the week comparing to the weekend. Uh, and in Spain, uh, most Spanish teenagers do, don't complete with uh, a screen time recommendation, especially at weekend, at weekend, sorry. Uh, uh, where the time spent is much higher. Well, uh, here we can see the, the levels, uh, the percentage exceeding two hours per day, a uh, little screen, they are very high, and TV and internet. And the third behavior is a sleep duration. I always said uh, in my workshops that this is the behavior that you can spend more time or you can spend whatever uh, um, uh, as long as you as long as you want. Peer research has found that children aged from 19 to 11 years old uh, sleep just uh, 7.87 uh, hours from then till uh, 9.52 a, a day. The recommendations from 6 till 13 years old are uh, from 9 till 11 hours of sleep a day and then 8 Till uh, 10 hours, uh, hours of sleep a day uh, for adolescents. Well, it is essential, it was found that the association between short sleep is uh, associated with overweight and obesity. And uh, short sleep time was significantly related to health negative consequences. Well, here we can see three very important uh, uh, researches that compose 
o eh, make the, 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 the creation of the later 24-hour movement guidelines. First of all, well, uh, they, they, they studied the association independently by Carson, Saput, uh, and Poitras, uh, and colleagues, uh, independent relationships, the first one with, uh, uh, with head-related association, the second one, sorted sleep durations associated with adverse physical and mental uh, health outcomes, and the third one by Poitras, uh, uh, physical activity was positively related with physical, psychological, social, and cognitive health uh, indicators. Well, we have conducted something uh, some studies at the University of Extremadura. One of them uh, I saw you here because it's a recent study uh, where the, the physical activity plays an important role uh, between the, uh, the, norm, the, the body image and uh, the perception of the weight of participants. And here we are. What study framework do we use to analyze the uh, uh, 24 hours of the healthy uh, lifestyle. Uh, in 2016, uh, it appeared the Canadian uh, 24 hour movement guidelines by Mark Tremblay uh, and colleagues. Uh, we said that uh, the recommendation, there are three recommendations uh, 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous uh, physical activity daily in the week, a sleep time from 11, 9 till 11 years old. And it uh, 11 sorry hours from uh, for children and from eight to ten hours for adolescents and to try not to accumulate more than two hours of screen time overall the recreational screen time and here it is where our investigations first of all we conducted a quasi experimental design all of them are, are published are already published in different uh, journal citation reports. Uh, studies. The first one is that was experimental design where during 10 sessions, 10 hour session uh, in a school, uh, we uh, found that uh, working with uh, 24 hour uh, behaviors, uh, we can get uh, participants to be more, uh, a, a, a greater adherence to Mediterranean diet, have been physically active. Then, the second study we conducted with adolescents. The first, the first study I saw this in the primary school with children. The second one, this one, is with adolescents. And not meeting any of the recommendation uh, was associated with lower academic performance. Uh, meeting at least two recommendations associated with higher academic performance in boys. And what is very important is that made two or three recommendations uh, is much better than none or one recommendation regarding academic performance, regarding language, English, uh, physical education, and mathematics. Then another, another study uh, uh, where the prevalence and the association with social uh, emotional problems uh, with individuals was uh, found. Uh, the participants who uh, met more recommendation uh, had lower uh, socioeconomical problems and than those who did not meet, uh, meet sorry. And uh, the last one, uh, this one, uh, adherence to 24 hour movement guidelines among Spanish adolescents, we conducted this study to try to show the prevalence of the 24 hour movement guidelines in our region. Sorry, because I, I think I didn't say that I came from Extremadura, it's in the neck, it's in the west of Spain, next to the border with Portugal. It's, it is a huge region with just two provinces. So this is this study came from that region. And um, well, uh, we found that boys meet the physical uh, activity and recommendations uh, in a, a greater uh, quantity and girls meet the screen time recommendation. With all of this, we, uh, we thought uh, uh, some colleagues, we thought to, to try to conduct a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, all around the world uh, to try to, to know the, uh, the prevalence uh, of meeting from preschool till adolescent. And we found that uh, just, well, 7.12, just a few of them uh, met the, the recommendation. But on the other side, 
there, 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 were, there, there was uh, a, a lot of uh, well, individuals uh, who did not meet this recommendation. And girls uh, have the, well, sorry, the, lower, the lowest uh, possibility to uh, complete the recommendation. Here I'm gonna show you two studies which are in revision. I asked for permission to my colleagues. This is one because uh, there was a lack of research regarding 24 hour movement guidelines and fitness. Uh, and we, we found that there is a, an important relationship regarding some aspects, some muscular strength, standing long jump. So it seems that, that uh, physical activity, uh, sorry, uh, the recommendation, the 24 hour movement guidelines, uh, may make some important consequences at fitness level. And then uh, we asked it uh, four or five months ago, we asked it, uh, what about body composition? There was any uh, researches regarding this uh, relationship. So we started, we spent uh, some part of our Christmas time during this uh, amazing, or this, for my point of view, nice uh, research. So meeting all the all three 24 hour movement guidelines is associated with lower obesity related outcomes among preschoolers, children and adolescents. And the results suggest that all components of the 24 hour movement behaviors should be tagged simultaneously. So it seems like that if uh, preschoolers, children, adolescents uh, meet the recommendation, they have a better uh, body composition. This is in, in review at the moment. Uh, well, we will cross fingers to try to be accepted in the, in the future. And then uh, what we have, uh, there are a lot of uh, other, uh, sorry, uh, healthy lifestyle or variables. And we try to, to join with the Mediterranean diet, uh, with the adherence to the Mediterranean diet. And we can uh, see that, well, the reduction of obesity uh, an overweight, better academic performance or, 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 or lower academic performance regarding, sorry, regarding the relationship and a greater or lower quality of life if uh, they are able to, well, complete and have a higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet. So what can we do or what we have done to try to uh, uh, promote the recommendations, uh, the 24 hour movement of recommendations. This is a real, uh, this is, they, they are real strategies we conducted uh, last year. And I'm gonna show you some of them uh, with the aim to promote the 24 hour movement guidelines and uh, the, other, uh, the other healthy variable, uh, which is the uh, nutritional variable. Uh, first of all, we work uh, at school with uh, preparation of some infographics with the aim to know the recommendation of food consumption with, the, as you can see, the healthy uh, eating plate, the Harvard plate, sorry. We prepare some infographic. This is the, the real one. And then I translate into English some of the, of the topics with the aim to develop critical awareness of students. Uh, we have the, the material has to take a lot, students sit. Uh, for example, you, you have to eat five times a, a day, you have to sleep enough, do physical activity daily, uh, hygiene, sorry, hygiene is essential. Well, uh, here we work, another strategy, another interactive activity, uh, strategy, sorry, uh, with the aim to know the health risk of the excessive screen time. Uh, we talk uh, the Charlie's Tale, uh, which is a boy uh, who has spent more than two hours of screen time and uh, he has not enough friends or he has uh, he changed his body and so on. And what, uh, in my experience and in my opinion, uh, 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 make aware of the of children about it. The another one is uh, well to try to uh, reinforce the learning acquired through the, inter the intervention about the sugar intake. Uh, here on the on the right, this this is a very famous website in sorry, I sorry in Spain, and we talk about the sugar uh, cubes, uh, the recommendation about sugar cubes uh, a day and uh, the current consumption. 
Another aware networks uh, with the aim to know their health reassessing with lower levels of physical activity. Uh, some didactic video we, we use during the intervention and we, during the, the workshops. Uh, here, this is a well, little famous one. Uh, what will the last 10 years of life be like? And um, well, uh, if you don't practice or if you are not active, uh, well, you're, you, you can have negative consequences uh, in, in, at the end of your, of your life. Uh, Another one uh, is to know the, the health risks associated with uh, excess uh, sugar. Uh, we changed the, the former website to some applications, some videos with the aim to uh, make awareness uh, children uh, not to uh, intake so much sugar. Another in, very important uh, strategy is uh, the organization of breaks. Uh, here in Spain, uh, uh, overall in Extremadura, uh, the, 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 there is a reduction of uh, active uh, practice during the, the breaks. Uh, so we propose a design alternative here, activities in the playground. We, we change the environment, uh, we promote some material, some self uh, build uh, material and with the aim to uh, increase the participation and so on. And here it is, where uh, an extracurricular challenge, challenge, challenge sorry, uh, with the aim to promote adoption of healthy habits through this challenge. This is a very important because we, for example, in, in Cáceres, we collect all the activities uh, out of school during the year to try to give this information to children and parents and uh, to, to, to give some tips uh, with the for example, here to, to create a healthy habit promoting car, uh, bike to school every day, going for a walk at least uh, last week, and to, change, to sign, sorry, this symbolic change. So, here, what we have done, uh, or what we, uh, we think it's very important to have success in the, in the intervention with the aim to promote from the school the 24-hour movement guidelines. First of all, to involve uh, teachers. Uh, this is very, very important. I think it's important all around the world because sometimes teachers, they, they are not uh, commit or, or, or involved, so to try, to convince them the importance of giving these uh, strategies, evaluate the intervention, not only the effects, uh, from our point of view, to try to change uh, this kind of behaviors, we need at least 10 hours, 10 sessions. Uh, I recognize that uh, it's much better to increase that duration, but the increase that duration to, uh, at the school, Sometimes, in my opinion, this a little bit, it's a little bit hard. Sustainability and cost of the intervention regarding the, the personal, the resources, uh, the materials, and so on, and inform the school of the results. This is uh, very important because we have uh, a, a little agreement between some schools uh, because we give them uh, the results, the information, and uh, we have the possibility to. Uh, uh, to, to, to research uh, with, with them. And here it is uh, some uh, prospect of future or some, uh, I don't know how to, to explain, some, well, some things I would like to do in the future. And, and one book I have here very close from, from, from this table, uh, I think it might be included this 24 hour movement guidelines in a, a pedagogical, in a model, in a model based practice. Uh, pedagogical models uh, such as Heather education model. And uh, well, here I have, uh, I give you, uh, I'm sure all of you have read the, the book or, uh, or have a look on it. Um, this is a book where uh, I've read and I recommend to, to, to apply or to try to mix the strategies, sorry, to try to mix the strategies I, I've, uh, I've talked about. It. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. I hope uh, you have 
uh, understood or, or I'm, I was able to explain more or less uh, everything. And thank you very much. I will be delighted to, to answer the questions uh, uh, you have later. Thank you very much. Pedro, thank you very much. It was uh, perfect. Um, we will go for the question and answers by, by the end. Now I give the floor to Andy Daldi Smith. Thank you again very much, Pedro, for your insights on this important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. I remember all uh, presents that can pose their questions during the presentations. I will pick them up and we will return to the questions by the end of all presentations. So Andy, be very welcome again. The floor is yours. Great, and thank you very much. Uh, I feel very honored to be uh, invited to speak today. Uh, so I'm gonna take a slightly different approach, which is to uh, explain how in the UK we've, we've built a whole school approach to physical activity and what that entails. So first of all, um, it's really just to summarize what the problem is. And wh while the problem's quite complex, it comes down to, to one major thing, and that is this tension between health and well-being and educational outcomes in the school environment. Uh, on Twitter, I, I follow someone called Brad Johnson, who's a kind of teacher educator in the uh, the USA, and, he, and I think he sums it up quite nicely, which, which is this kind of focus on standardized testing has really changed the um, educational uh, environment within schools, and that we've taken the love of learning away and replaced it with this kind of um, <clears throat> system that focuses on uh, skilling children up to do well on educational tests. But by doing that, we've lost this kind of play, fun, exploring, creating uh, within the school system. And if you think about those words, most of those really align with physical activity. So we kind of ironed physical activity out of a child's day within the school environment. Um, one of our previous papers, we looked at the segmented school day for physical activity, and we found ironically, um, that maths and language, so in England, it was, obviously it was English, were the most inactive period of a child's day, even when we take leisure time physical activity into account. So we've created these environments where children spend most of the day uh, sitting and obviously sedentary rather than being physically active. So in the UK, we, we wanted to, uh, to um, address this issue and I've, today's presentation isn't going to be going through the Creating Active Schools framework in detail. I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about this in more detail in other talks. But we pulled multiple stakeholders together. So linking on from the first presentation, we worked with teachers, head teachers, public health representatives, uh, UK international researchers. And we wanted to get a shared understanding of what a whole school approach looks like, because if we don't share the understanding, what we find is that the different stakeholder groups are trying to achieve something very different. So back in 2019, we created the, the Creating Active Schools framework using uh, the UK Design Council double diamond approach, oh, which, oh, which is here. Uh, we went through sort of the six design phases. This was highly modified though. So we switched groupings between same stakeholder groupings. So teachers together, head teachers, so on and so forth and into mixed stakeholder groupings. And it was in the mixed stakeholder groupings that we did the majority of the design work once we knew what the problems and the factors were that we needed to address. And uh, once we went through that, and this is what the kind of process looked like, we had six models being designed and developed and people voting for which they felt uh, most represented the school system. And then we kind of carried that on with further design work online uh, before we came up with the final framework, which I showed you. Just going back into that framework to very quickly overview it, it starts in the middle. So it's not a top to bottom or bottom up. It starts in the middle. And what we've realized through our work since 29 with this framework is the importance of focusing on the school culture um, and ethos because that drives the policy and vision of schools. And quite often when we work with any physical activity, and I use that in the broadest sense to involve school sport and physical education, any initiative, we focus down on the opportunity level, at which is at the bottom and where that initiative occurs. But actually what is missing in the majority of interventions is shifting the policy of schools. So we work a lot with schools around, for example, rewriting their um, 
teaching and learning policies to introduce physical activity, because if it's in the policy, the policy drives the behavior of the, the stakeholders within the school, i.e. the teachers. And we've done um, an initial nine month uh, evaluation of this, looking at organizational change in schools. And we're starting to see that CAS is influencing at that higher level of the system, which is having trickle down effects on the staff and the opportunities that have been provided. So in terms of um, moving on to how we've actually implemented the framework, because the framework really is just a nice pretty picture of the what. It's, it's almost like the ingredients of a recipe, but it's not the recipe itself of how we create the change. So we, we sort of delved into implementation science, and I'm quite happy to admit this it was a really new field to me, and it still really is a new field to me. So we are learning as we go. Um, but we sort of check in with implementation scientists who are advising us, uh, working with a few people in the States, uh, and helping us to make sure that we're, uh, we're not doing things that we shouldn't. Because you know what reviewers for journal articles can be like if you uh, kind of go off track and misuse things, which is always good. So... Um, there was a really great piece of work by uh, uh, Sam Cesar um, and uh, Harriet Courts, where they did a systematic review looking at school-based interventions. And the kind of headline from that really was that implementation models weren't being used uh, within the development or development delivery and evaluation of school-based physical activity programs. So what we're seeing is that models were being retrospectively fitted to the data um, or um, may be used to shape the intervention in the delivery, but not in the development of it. So there's very few programs that have used implementation science throughout the three stages. So we were really keen to integrate that within the implementation model for CAS. We've also integrated uh, implementation strategies um, and, and the COMB framework as well. So we're taking a behavior change approach uh, across the school system. So how all of that comes together, and I apologize for the, for the uh, complexity, is into our logic model. So on the left, you can see we mapped out the determinants. We took about six months to truly understand this, and we did this at a national level. We actually used some of the conferences that we presented at and put integrated tasks in there to uh, get people to tell us about what the sort of barriers and facilitators were within the school system. We've also done this at a region and a local level. And all of that has fed into uh, the determinant framework that we've used. We've mapped it against the CIFA framework, which is Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, that helps us to understand this kind of organizational setting and where these barriers and facilitators might occur. Moving into the next two columns, the third, sorry, the third column, which is the CAS actions. That's the actual program assets. That's the approach that we're taking. And you can see they're split across a number of levels because... CAS is, while it's been um, co-led by a research organization, which is myself and my team at the University of Bradford and um, uh, Bradford Teaching Hospital Foundation Trust, it's been, it's been delivered by practice and practice are running with it. So I would say we're kind of sprinting before we can crawl, which is quite uncomfortable as a researcher. But actually, we've had to let go of that standard research approach where we go from efficacy to effectiveness, scale up and so on. We've gone to scale up. And we're trying to understand it at scale up. And my view from uh, working in whole systems approaches to physical activity is actually, I think we make this mistake where we go, we'll try something and make it efficacious. And then we'll try and do it in a slightly bigger scale and test to see whether it's effective or not. Well, actually, what we keep losing is the assets of the program that made it efficacious when we go to effectiveness. And then the same when we go to scale up is we, we start to lose elements of the program that have helped it be successful. So actually the program looks very different when you get to scale up than it did when you worked with two or three schools right back in the beginning. What we've done is flip that on its head and gone, we'll work with any school that wants to work with us. But actually we need to understand, does it work? How does it work? What's working well? What's not working so well? And if things aren't working so well, we need to address that and improve it for the next iteration. So we've just put a large bid into our uh, National uh, Research Council for 1.8 million to evaluate CAS at a national level. So that's to look at our actions and our implementation strategies. Uh, they link to our mechanism of actions, which are aligned to the COMB framework. So looking at behavior of the different stakeholders within the system. So that's children as the end beneficiaries, but also stakeholders within 
providing the experience, um, but also looking at teachers, school staff, school leaders and locality leads beyond schools. And then finally, the outcomes that we're interested in, we've mapped to the REAIM framework, but this has been uh, more recently influenced by McKay's framework, looking at implementation, uh, determinants and outcomes within schools. So how does it work? Uh, we've got a national team, which is a partnership of three organisations. We, we support locality-based communities of practice, and that locality flexes to the needs of the local system. So that could be a local authority, which is council-led. It could be a multi-academy trust, which is led by education, or it could be an active partnership, which is our kind of community arm of, of the national sports organisation, Sport England. Or it could be a, a, a combination of those three. And the reason for that flex is we need to flex to the needs of the localised system and who are the stronger players within that system. And, and we're not limited to these locality based partners. Those locality partners are then trained and then they support the schools within their local area to with their CAS or creating active schools delivery. So how do we su create support across the system? Well, as a national team, we train uh, the locality leads and that's through a two day uh, training program. And that's not around the delivery of physical activity. We're working very, very differently. So it's about how do you work with and influence strategic levels within schools? Because there's lots of experience and expertise in terms of delivering physical activity to children. But actually, when we look at the physical activity sector in the UK, there's very limited expertise on actually going into influence schools at a senior level to get them to change their policies around physical activity. So we focus at that kind of higher systems level. We then support them through monthly online webinars because the, the localities are spread across England. And we have an annual conference where we bring practice back together and share um, good examples and share learning to improve for the next year. At the school level, we do national one day training and uh, we're delivering our first kind of formal um, one day training course uh, sort of in the first half of this year. This has been done informally up till now. Uh, we then build locality led communities of practice. So CAS doesn't um, tell schools what they have to do for physical activity. It helps them to profile and understand their, their current provision and design their own approaches moving forward. So how do we do that? We focus on four things. We look at policy, we look at the environments, we look at the stakeholders and we look at the opportunities for physical activity. We profile across those four areas. So actually there's 22 subdomains across those four kind of uh, main themes and they're mapped onto the framework as you can see. We use a four step annual approach. So the first step is review what you do. The second step is plan and prioritize evidence-based solutions. The third is carrying out the actions, so actually implementing your ideas. And then we get schools to monitor and evaluate. And we're currently developing tools to help them monitor and evaluate what they do. So how does that look like? We've got an online profiling tool. This is an example of the policy. So it's got five areas looking at school and things from school improvement to communication, professional development, and the schools answer questions. And it gives them uh, a reporting score and helps them to identify areas of high impact. And it's those ident areas of high impact where the school chooses to work. Each of the 22 subdomains has got an online CPD module to help schools get sorted because we want to be able to help all schools, but equally we want to be able to put resource, more hands-on resource into those schools that are in greatest need. So we need those online CPD modules to do the heavy lifting. So two of the, I'll finish with sort of two of the key messages that we've learned now through um, going on into our third year of implementation is that autonomous implementation is an absolute must. We need to stop work going into schools with nicely packaged programs and expecting schools to implement those for us um, and then testing the effects. And the reason for that is schools are incredibly different. And if we take, you know, this is a very simplistic view, but we look at this is two schools within a, uh, within a two mile radius of each other within Bradford. You can see the school on the right has hardly any outdoor space, very limited green space. So if we went in there and asked them to do uh, the daily mile, but I mean, basically running around the, the, the school playground and sort of torturing children for 15 minutes a day. I'm really not a fan of the daily mile <laughs> in case people haven't guessed uh, versus the school on the left. That's got a huge amount of green space and you can see a multi-use uh, games area. 
how can you expect those two schools to do exactly the same thing? Well, you can't. The school on the left has got far more um, resource, and that's just looking at the physical environment, never mind the complexities of the social environment, stakeholder behavior, attitudes towards physical activity, so on and so forth. The last is um, how, we bet, how we design experiences for children around physical activity. And quite often we base them on policy outcomes. So we go, right, well, kids need 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity a day in schools. So we're going to put 15 minutes here and 10 minutes here. And actually, quite often that tends to lead to physical activity experiences that children don't value. And if they don't value them, they're therefore not going to continue them uh, in later years. So we sort of push and work with our schools to put passion and fun at the absolute base of every physical activity opportunity, because if you enjoy something, you'll come back to it. Next, we ask them to build in opportunities for socialization, because we know if you do things with friends, again, it's more likely to uh, help to reinforce the behavior and you're more likely to stay with that behavior. And next is the cognitive challenge. Children want growth. They want to be challenged. They want to see themselves developing. And if we get these three right, we then get the three, the three things that we desire as policymakers, researchers, educators, which is we will improve fitness. We will develop fundamental movement skills. And if public health, we'll get those minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. But absolutely, they should not be at the front and center. So to focus on the motivation and by focusing on the motivation to be physically active, we will get the byproducts. So what does all of this create for us, which we're quite excited about because we've got this profiling tool. And this is where I'll finish. Um, schools understand their own performance and what they're doing. That data is not shared on a school by school level. So it's not used to beat them over the head. It's used to support them to create effective systems. But that data feeds up to a locality level. So it helps localities understand what school collective schools needs are. We then use that data at a national level to, or we will be doing moving forward to show pictures of what are the needs of schools? Where do, the, where do the national government agencies need to start investing in schools to help school-based physical activity? Is it physical education? Is it physically active learning? Is it active travel policies and plans? So on and so forth. And we're linking some of this work now internationally through a piece of work the World Health Organization mapping stakeholders beyond the school environment and understanding what are their needs and how do we help them to work with schools? Because if you come up, for example, through the public health system, you've never studied the education system and very probably don't understand how it works like I didn't when I first started and probably still don't. So actually, what are the learning needs of those stakeholders beyond schools so we can help them more effectively work with and support schools in their physical activity offering? Um, I'd just like to finish and say uh, this all sounds really lovely and nice and neatly polished. Um, it's absolutely not. And I do feel like I've got my head in a dinosaur's mouth most days uh, and I'm banging my head against the wall because it is in insanely complex. Um, but I, it's just great fun. Great fun when you see schools starting to make positive change um, uh, for physical activity. So I will finish there and say thank you very much and look forward to taking any questions later. Thank you very much, Andy, for your excellent uh, presentation also. Now I'll give the floor to Ruth Santos, and hopefully we'll have three or four minutes by the end for some questions of the audience. Ruth, the floor is yours. And thank you, Andy, once again. Brilliant uh, presentation, such as Pedro. Thank you. Okay. So um, good morning, everybody. Thank you um, very much, Raul, for this invitation. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I also like to, to say hi to Andy and Pedro and thank you for your presentations as well. I've, um, in this last half an hour, I've, I was able to learn a lot, so which is also always very, very uh, good uh, for me and, and enjoyable. So today I will talk a little bit about two projects that we um, are currently involved. Um, I, um, I am uh, at the moment the chair of the Portuguese 24 hour movement guidelines project. Um, and uh, Joan is uh, my colleague as well in these um, two projects. Um, so I'll just give you an overview on the process and how we are uh, doing our guidelines and what we have done so far and how we are going to promote them. So um, I believe this is redundant uh, because we all know what's, um, what the 24-hour movement paradigm represents. 
So just briefly, uh, I'll start with the economics of time. Um, usually this is what we lack. Um, and therefore we do make decisions on a daily basis on how do we allocate our time because usually it's very um, short. Um, so in a more conscious way or less conscious way, we decide to be more physically active or sleep more or be more sedentary um, so that we can are able to do whatever we propose to do um, all of it uh, uh, around the, the whole day. And of course that we can only do one of these movements at a time or none movements at a time. So if we decided to be more physically active today, um, what are we going to uh, not doing? What, what, would, what would do we decide to short? Is it our sleep or is it our sedentary? Um, time. So um, the time use epidemiology tries to uh, work around this uh, issue of the 24 hour movements on how we use this, um, how we use this time, what are, uh, you know, the prevalence, what are the health associations, and uh, how do we better uh, measure and assess these movement behaviors, and how do we promote um, knowledge translation better, and how do we uh, design better interventions? Um, we know that all these behaviors influence health, and sometimes they overlap on their health um, influences. Uh, but usually, or until probably a decade ago, they have been uh, traditionally um, studied in isolation, which um, did not allow us until recently to understand the synergic effects that you that these three behaviors when they are properly um, achieved uh, can influence our health and therefore um, previous guidelines have also been uh, constructed um, in isolation so for each of these movements so but when there was the first papers on this back in the, in 2014 uh, and 2015 uh, begun to show us that having a, uh, an appropriate combination of these movement behaviors would bring um, uh, uh, health benefits. And therefore the Canadians uh, launched their first 24 hour movement guidelines for um, children and youth um, in 2016. And since then we adapted them in Australia um, and uh, we had a launch uh, of the guidelines together with the Canadians for the early years. Um, these guidelines from Australia and Canada are very similar, and they were adopted um, afterwards by the WHO, so World Health Organization. And more recently, Canada also developed their uh, adults and uh, elderly uh, guidelines for older adults. Uh, in Portugal, we did not, we don't have so far the 24 guidelines, nor we have adopted or adapted or constructed any uh, 24 hour movement guidelines. So that is our main um, project at the moment. Um, we, as Andy, I feel that I have a time out in a dinosaur, but the problem is that I created the dinosaur. So <laughs> it's a double issue. <laughs> Um, but hopefully we'll <laughs> get over this and we will launch the first guidelines for adults and other adults this year, and then uh, the children and adolescents in a couple of years. So um, we have this uh, big process that I will go over uh, very uh, fastly. So we decided to build our own systematic reviews, which is a, uh, uh, a huge task um, and it has been going on for the last three years um, or two years and a half. Um, so after that we'll have uh, first uh, our first guidelines proposals and then we have a lot of uh, stakeholders consultation and meetings um, and then we will launch uh, the guidelines. Um, of course that public health guidelines have um, many benefits they will not change the world per se but we do need to have a guidelines in order to uh, better promote uh, health and prevent eventually disease um, we know that uh, this unified message about um, movement behaviors will bring added benefits um, because for example if 
a given person wants to know how much does my child need to sleep, they will also be directed to the other information regarding physical activity and sedentary behavior. And we believe that this type of dissemination, it will be, bring efficiency in terms of public health uh, um, messages. Also, public health guidelines are, are extremely important for surveillance systems and surveillance purposes. Um, so this project has been um, developing in consultation always with the Ministry of Health, with our uh, General Director of Health, um, and at, uh, with, the, with, the program, uh, with the National Program of Physical Activity Promotion. So recently, we also um, secured funding for uh, um, a, a project that it is an afterthought of the 25 movement guidelines called MOVE24. Um, and the idea is to work on a complete knowledge translation plan for the dissemination and implementation of the guidelines. So our this project has three main aims. Um, so the first one is to develop a complete knowledge translation, uh, translation plan. The second one is to adapt or develop um, new uh, self-reported instruments to determine 24-hour uh, movement guidelines compliance. This was a need that we um, that we verified through a, a couple of systematic reviews. We don't have uh, valid questionnaires um, for any of of age groups for for uh, none of the age groups um, that ask in an integrated way. Uh, or that can allow us to evaluate in an integrated fashion um, the three uh, movement and or non-movement behaviors. So we are working uh, at the moment on this. Uh, and then finally to develop, uh, to pilot an international uh, registry on 24-hour movement behaviors. So for the knowledge translation plan, um, we will um, Sorry, I'll just pass through this for. Uh, so we'll have three phases, the dissemination, the implementation, and the evaluation. And here we would like to target ed the education sectors, the, the end users um, directly, as well as the uh, health professionals. And we will do this um, taking into consideration, um, for example, in schools, because we are here talking today about schools, the whole school approach system, um, the, the schools for health in Europe um, frameworks, as well as Andy framework that he has just explained on, on physical activity promotion within schools. Um, and we will always try to do this, uh, all the dissemination activities and, and materials um, within, within a co-creation process with teachers and with students. Um, we would like to have materials and messages and activities and training for, for teachers, uh, as well as for health professionals. Um, that exactly was, was what was Andy saying, that they value and that they are important to them um, so that we can increase the odds of a real uh, uh, and good implementations, implementation. And then um, we will try to do an evaluation of whatever we had implemented or created um, and to see exactly what worked and what didn't work so that we can have um, lessons for the future. Um, because the idea is actually, if, if we are going to promote any change, it really has to be sustainable. So that's what we are working to with a team of um, psychologists because they believe in, um, not they, we, we also believe in that. Uh, so in these behavioral change theories, we also have, someone from a health communication and marketing. Um, and of course, we do have ourselves as, as researchers in, in, um, uh, from different areas um, and um, a publicist as well. Uh, so we are working with, with um, a very multidisciplinary team to, to, um, to develop all these instruments. So hopefully a year from now, if we do something like this again, I will have uh, other things to show you and, and uh, to let you know how the process went. Um, and then, of course, we will share every uh, stuff that we do in our website that is being constructed at the moment as well. Um, so to adopt or, or to construct the novel um, instruments to determine 24-hour movement guidelines, we are going to have, uh, so we did the reviews, we selected the items, we conducted face validity and decided the final set of instruments, and we are now um, working on the studies of validity uh, and uh, reliability. 
Hopefully they will be reliable and valid. Um, the, the instruments that we created so far, we have done it for uh, adults and older adults, and we are beginning this process with children and adolescents. So after the age of uh, older than uh, 12 years old. Um, so the idea is to, to have an instrument that can be uh, published, of course, in a scientific paper, but uh, most uh, more importantly, that can be valid and reliable, and that can be used to assess 24-hour um, guidelines, no matter what the guidelines are, because the guidelines may change in a few years, but if we, still, if we have an instrument that allows us um, to go, uh, to be used for many years, and even if the guidelines change, this would be uh, an important goal to achieve, and obviously it can be translated then in other languages and can and other countries can do their, their validity or reliability studies. So finally, we would like to pilot an international 24-hour uh, movement behavior registry where um, anyone from around the world can deposit their own data, can enter on, on the website and answer to our questionnaires that we are working on. Um, as well as other uh, correlates that might influence these movement behaviors or, or eventually health outcomes. Um, but we also want this registry to be able um, to gather complete data sets from researchers around the world that who wish to deposit their data there uh, or their data sets, and that can be used for um, researchers from all over the world. Of course, that will have to do a lot of um, protocols and, and security around confidentiality and around data protection, but we are working with engineers um, to, to do this. So um, we do believe, yeah, so it should be open uh, plan. So we do believe that um, once this project is complete and, and, uh, and the deliveries are, um, are out there, uh, this is our attempt to push forward the field on, of, on monitoring and, and on knowledge translation of 24-hour movement behaviors. Um, and of course that we can um, leverage the creation of new knowledge and ensure that funds and efforts are, um, on developing that knowledge are not wasted. So this is, this is why I do believe that open data sets and, and pooling data is uh, quite important as a responsible um, way and ethical way of doing science because there is no point of um, collecting new data if existing data answers our questions um, uh, because it, collecting data is a huge effort financially and, and uh, in terms of human resources and burden for participants so if we have data that answers our questions I believe that we should reanalyze it as, as much as we can. Um, so this is our small contribution that we are working on. As soon as we have more uh, data and results, I'll be happy to present and to uh, disseminate. So thank you. Thank you, Ruth, very much for your excellent presentation and for sharing your experience and knowledge with us today. We still have two minutes, so uh, we have two questions in the chat. Um, I will pause and uh, Ruth, Pedro or Andy, you can pick uh, the, the question if you want to answer. So Marcus asked, can this paradigm uh, be worked within the physical education school subject? Uh, we know that within schools, physical education has a, a special status for promoting healthy lifestyles. So can this paradigm be worked within the physical education um, subject? And the other question is from Mark Close. Um, Mark asked, such projects underline that it would be great to prepare an important group of professionals able to guide school staffs and stakeholders to implement these projects. Is it already envisaged? So two questions. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I can take the one around um, physical education. So I, th I think... There was one around, um, I'd like to pose, what's the place and role of physical, act physical activity learning and physical education within the opportunities? So in the CAS framework, PE or physical education is one of the, the seven opportunities. Kind of our view on physical education is that quite often it gets an unfair expectation 
of delivering all of the physical activity in a child's day. And that can come at the detriment of developing a child's fundamental movement skills. Because, you know, if, if we want to make physical education very active, just make children run around the playground for 45 minutes. But developmentally, that's not the best activity. So that's why we position physical education as a, as a core opportunity for physical activity, but it is not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is around um, developing physical literacy. Thank you, Andy. Any other comments, Ruth or Pedro? Yeah, yeah. go Ruth, Pedro. You first? Yes. Me? Okay, yes, I agree. Vamos, vamos. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, I agree with uh, Andy. Uh, totally agree because uh, while here we have uh, in Spain the curriculum or, or, or the things you have to, to, to teach they are different and the time to spend uh, during uh, to make physical activity is not enough but it is a very very good place to try to promote and in my opinion uh, we think we have changed it uh, for example well during this week we have have some workshops to try to promote the 24-hour movement guidelines uh, among uh, uh, physical education teachers and other subjects, uh, which are very, very important uh, because it seems that, that physical activity and sedentary behaviors, they, they belong uh, just to physical education teachers and uh, this uh, it affects to, to, to the rest. And uh, I, I think we can uh, we can include it, we can promote it, but as Andy has said, uh, the most important thing is not to, to promote in uh, or at the school, but out of the school. That's the very, very difficult one. And this is uh, it's very important because we have uh, conducted uh, one systematic review with meta-analysis, which is at the moment in review, but it's different uh, regarding extracurricular programs. And um, there are just uh, just a few uh, regarding a uh, motivational and uh, and the effects in physical activity. Sorry to try to explain, but there, there are just uh, uh, so we have to work harder in in that line. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Just to add a bit, so I totally agree what we, what it has been said. Um, it's a business of everybody to promote health and health behaviors. So uh, within schools uh, and taking this whole school approach, whole systems approach, we need everybody to promote health behaviors, no matter which health behaviors we are talking about. So it's it's not just a business of physical education teachers. Of course, that I agree with Andy. They have uh, they're an opportunity, uh, really um, nice opportunity to, to to increase physical activity of children. But if of course, that promoting other uh, movement skills, it's, it's the main business of, of um, physical education, not just uh, uh, physical activity in terms of volume or, or, or intensity. Um, so, of course, the, the active breaks within, um, there are many, many uh, um, papers out there and research being conducted on, on active learning of other school subjects and other activities that you can promote within the school context um, to promote physical activity, to reduce sedentary behavior, to promote um, optimal levels of well-being within, for example, childcare studies, uh, optimal levels, sorry, not the well-being of sleep, uh, which is always been, it's always, I feel that it is always neglected a little bit within schools. We talk a lot about nutrition and how we are the Mediterranean pattern here in the Mediterranean countries and how, what children should eat and they should not smoke and blah, blah, blah. But we always forget about sleep. <laughs> um, and we also have this uh, preconception that, oh, the physical activity part, it's uh, the physical education uh, teacher's business. <laughs> uh, it's not our business. Um, yeah, but and and also influencing at a high level. Uh, if um, if policy changes, uh, then it makes it easier to implement um, other uh, more concrete activities in schools for sure. Yeah. So, thank you, thank you very much. We need to intervene at different levels in different contexts. Uh, your presentations bring up that. Um, Marcus was reacting that physical literacy, as Andy said. For him, it was a, a main outcome of physical um, education. 
So you yep. have done uh, provoking and thoughtful uh, presentations. Very good. My head is like in a dinosaur right now. It's <laughs> <laughs> together with yours, and I'm willing to to learn more and collaborate in the future with you all. I think it was a very good uh, ISAP connect to think differently about these uh, uh, healthy behaviors promotion in school and other contexts. Thank you very much for your uh, presentations. Thank you to all colleagues that attended and participated in this event. Please keep connected to ISAP. Uh, ISAP wishes you, uh, you all a nice Friday and weekend. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.